two of uh, the workshop. Uh, first, a couple of reminders. First of all, you're all invited to uh, get screaming drunk at my my house. Uh, Start at 7 p.m. Uh, <laughs> uh, at, uh, and if you don't know the address, so that's not me. Um, Can I be a quiet drunk? Um, <laughs> well, everybody else be screaming, so I don't, I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, if you didn't get your um, your beer cooler, then uh, ask uh, Marcy. And if you open up and there's no beer in your beer cooler, then, then definitely talk to Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> so, because um, that yeah, you need supplies for tonight, I guess. Um. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, good thing. Okay, yeah, bring you in cooler. That's right. Um, so, but uh, let's see. So. Ah, oh, I feel terrible. I've been doing such a terrible job of introduction. So I'm not going to do better today because I'd show favoritism. Just let me say that uh, Yvette Borkar, as known by most of you, is uh, you know, an absolute um, pioneer in stochastic control and reinforcement learning and um, stochastic approximation and other topics which you will feel like you're talking about. <laughs> and my, my very first sabbatical was actually visiting Yvette at the Institute of Science a life-changing experience for him. And now he's at the ISI to run the way. And so this title of this talk is a reinforcement learning in part of the I would like to thank Sean for inviting me. Also, uh, he has made me feel much younger because the biography there puts me back in Indian Institute of Science, where I, which I left 15 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I chose this topic because I know that uh, both these uh, Team's interest, Sean, in particularly the first, and you, as you might guess, that both have to do with systems where you do not uh, observe the state completely. So I'll start with uh, some preamble about uh, partially observed Markov chains. Of course, uh, there's a lot of overlap with what uh, Ramon did yesterday, but uh, anyway, I'll do it because uh, it will set up the notation. So there's a first theme, and there's a quote from some famous poets of last century about confusion partial observations might cause. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, what you saw yesterday. And this is a uh, hidden Markov model is what basically the object of interest. So there's a, a, a state and observation process xn comma yn where xn is the state process and yn is the observation process. Both I assume they take uh, finitely many possible values. And uh, the evolution is described by this transition mechanism that the probability that the next state is i and next observation is j given the entire path depends on your present state xn and is given by this function small p i i comma j given xn. The objective is to estimate uh, the state given the observations up to time n. That is to say we want the pi sub n, there's the conditional distribution of xn given the observations y i i less than equal to n. And I assume pi naught is known. Okay, so uh, the aim will be let's fix some capital N. And the aim is to find the conditional expectation of uh, f of x sub capital N given the observations up to capital N. Okay, so let me introduce some more notation. So p of y. So this is a parameterized family of matrices. Here I keep y fixed as a parameter and. Uh, consider j and i belonging to the state space. So this is this will be, uh, I mean, this not quite a uh, transition matrix because the row sums may not add to one. So in general, it's a sub-stochastic matrix. I'll also use uh, this bold face one for the uh, vector of all ones. Then uh, it's well known that uh, conditional distribution it is a row vector of x, xn given observations up to time n is given recursively by this non filtering equation. So this, I'm, this is a row vector, so pi n plus 1 is pi n times you multiply by this matrix p evaluated at the parameter value y sub n plus 1, that's the latest observation and the normalized. That should be, uh, there should be a p there too, right? Pi n 1 is just 1. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, this uh, p missing, p y n plus 1. And, um, Alternately, uh, so I have noted def this, this definition appears on the next slide. So, uh, alternatively, I can r write it as a, some another non-negative major valued process, not necessarily probability major, also normalized. But um, the advantage of this process, which I define next, will be the fact that you, uh, the evolution is linear, whereas this one is a non-linear evolution. 
So that's simply this. Okay, so to evaluate pi and f, it's enough to calculate this ratio. So just this is a major value process. You take uh, average of f with respect to this process and normalize uh, divided by the total mass. And uh, I can restate my, since I can, if I evaluate, it, di evaluate this and this, this gives me pi sub n of f. I can rephrase my objective as that of evaluating u sub n of f for a generic f. Okay. So let me define this v sub n of i. So I chose the letter capital V because this should remind you of a value function in dynamic programming. So this is nu sub n of f when nu small n is frozen at uh, Dirac major at i. That is to say that, uh, so earlier I had defined, I was looking at the uh, xn comma yn for n running from 0 to capital N. Now I consider the process from small n to capital N. So small n is my initial time, I consider the initial condition as i and let it run to capital N and then this would be the unnormalized average of uh, f. Okay. So and that's what I say here. So this is computed as if the state was known to be exactly I at time n. Now this will be given by the, it is a dynamic programming like equation where you can write this backward recursion. Uh, given that at time capital N, you, you just have a new n of i is fi, so terminal condition and you do this backward iteration to calculate v sub n. And similarly, so that was for uh, f. Now, for the normalizing factor, I also need the terminal condition equal to 1. So, the similar, this is exactly same, uh, I mean, same form as this, except that uh, instead of f, I have 1. So, I sort of uh, to distinguish this from the previous one, I have put a hat here. Okay, the, so the pre uh, let me again go back here. So, remember, keep this uh, sort of remember this equation. So, backward recursion for v sub n. And I rewrite it as this. So I just multiply and divide by some transient matrix Q. Yeah. So transient probability is Q, where Q is some irreducible stochastic matrix. And what I'll do is consider a Markov chain x tilde n with transient matrix Q and initial distribution pi naught. So this is basically like importance sampling chain. So this is those of you who are familiar with um, Markov chain Monte Carlo, when you calculate the average with respect to some sample average of a Markov chain. Instead of the original measure, you can use some other equivalent measure, I mean, some, some other uh, transition mechanism with respect to which the original one is absolutely continuous. And then you have to correct it by plugging in the likelihood ratio. Otherwise, you would get the wrong average. So roughly the same idea here. So I have plugged in this likelihood ratio like object here. And then uh, what I do is, uh, have several independent runs, which are called particles. So think of m different particles running, and uh, they are indexed by a superscript k. Okay, and then uh, the uh, now we'll talk about the algorithm. The most sim uh, naive thing to do would be just to take the time average. So this would be what the simplest particle filter would do. So I've just uh, taken this object summed it over all my realizations and uh, taken the time average. And uh, then by just by law of large numbers, you will, uh, as m tends to infinity, it con it's consistent. It converges to the quantities you want. Okay, because if you just uh, write down the expectation of this, it will, uh, you will write the qi naught i1, qi1 i2, uh, dot, 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 and it will cancel off with this and you will get what you want, the corresponding piece there. In what sense is this Markov chain Monte Carlo? This is just independent samples, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's what, uh, okay, it's a combination of both. <laughs> this is that each sample path is a Markov chain path, and then you are, uh, there are independent such paths. Okay. This, is, this is not the proposal. This is, not <laughs> this is the simplest version. There's no sense yeah. in what you mean, Markov chain Monte Carlo. This is Monte Carlo. No, this is a into for a completely different reason. Yeah, yeah. This is a <laughs> this is a kind of a naive particle filter. Let me let me put it that way. I'm going to change it soon. Okay. <laughs> these these er, these types of algorithms have error that grows exponentially in time. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I, uh, I see your point. I shouldn't have this. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, 
Okay, so I'll give the learning version of it, which is the objective. So another quote from a famous poet who in late 60s uh, sort of foresaw the importance of learning algorithms and also their, <laughs> also their limitations. <laughs> okay, so let me just short self speech for reinforcement learning. So it's uh, convenient to view reinforcement learning as some kind of a cross between and this is not for this particular problem, but for example, say for approximate dynamic programming uh, or policy evaluation of, uh, say, fixed control policy in Markovitian process. So one could view for a, in such application, one can view it as a kind of a cross between MCMC and uh, iterative schemes like uh, policy iteration or value iteration. In fact, what reinforcement learning does is it's a stochastic approximation variant of uh, the classical schemes in some sense. You, you have to tweak it a bit sometimes, but uh, that's the intuition. Now it has uh, more per iteration, per, per iterate computation than the MCMC, but it's a much lower computation than uh, the uh, classical uh, iterative schemes for solving dynamic programming equations because uh, it's, it's a sort of s typically the simple incremental schemes. You take one sample, plug it in, and make a small correction. Okay. And that's sort of typically true for stochastic approximation. It generally has lower, uh, lower variance because there's an implicit conditional averaging there uh, compared to MCMC, but higher variance than deterministic schemes, schemes obviously, because it's, there's no variance for deterministic schemes. So there are trade offs involved. Okay, so uh, this is the, so I had that backward equation like object here. Yeah, this, this equation uh, for F and this for one. And this is the stochastic approximation or learning variant of it. So what I do is take a, I'm running a, uh, I run this chain X tilde K plus one sub N. So I take, uh, if I at time, so this is K plus first chain at time N, uh, uh, suppose I, um, at time N I, uh, I'm in state I and then I move to some N plus one and so you have observation Y and, and this of course is given. So I plug these values in and make an incremental correction to my previous iterate, I think this, uh, yeah, that's okay. So um, take a co convex combination of the previous uh, guess plus this uh, correction term with the sort of conditional likelihood ratio plugged in here. And the step sizes are chosen according to usual robbins monroe scheme. And similarly for uh, the normalizing factor, just only difference is that I have a one here instead of f. And then the claim is that this works, and uh, the usual ODE analysis will show you that. For, uh, ignore this. This this kind of factors come because of uh, sort of asynchronous, uh, the asynchronous uh, computation. You are running just a single chain, so the fraction of times uh, any given state is visited, etc., matters. But as long as this is bounded away from zero, it doesn't matter. So if you ignore this, uh, consider these differential equations, which are particularly simple. So for n equal to capital N, it's frozen. So if you take n equal to capital N minus one, this part will be frozen. And therefore you can show that uh, it will converge to the fixed point of the backward equation, uh, the uh, not fixed point, sorry. Solution, uh, the one iteration of the backward equation. Then you go sort of from n minus one to n minus two and so on. Successively one can uh, argue that this differential equations converge to the solution of the, the particular backward equations which I had. And by the standard uh, OD analysis of stochastic approximation, when, uh, this follows. Okay, so that's kind of standard technology, so I won't go into the details of that. Okay, uh, suspicion I want to finish very early. Oh. <laughs> you don't have to worry about uh, delays today. So, so huh? what is the, what is the I, I'm sort of missing the point, I think. Oh, okay, yeah. Why yeah. are we doing this? <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> to basic, uh, th this reduces uh, uh, essentially. If you in, uh, if you think of uh, 
reinforcement learning as a MC, uh, stochastic approximation variant of MCMC, what you gain is that you reduce variance considerably and that's uh, Sean has for example been using that idea quite a lot. He, it takes fluid limits and then looks at the corresponding value functions and use them as control variates. So it's, it's sort of a But is it something you can do to any sampling, any Marco, uh, uh, Monte Carlo problem? I mean, if I just give you a distribution yeah. and I say I want a sample from it, would, I mean... So, yeah, if it's a... Uh, so you can certainly do that for the kind of averages you look for in uh, dynamic programming. Because you have, uh, what you do is write the corresponding, see what I'm doing is, uh, okay, let's go to a simpler case. Suppose I want to estimate, say, expected discounted cost, okay? What I do is I write the fixed point equation for the value function, which involves the conditional average. And I solve this equation by Robbins Mandro. Yeah, by just write the stochastic approximation version of it, where I remove the conditional average, plug in an actual sample there and then use this, in, make an incremental move uh, the, in, so that the stochastic approximation does the averaging for you. So that's the idea. And because you are conditioning, uh, sort, um, it's like this raw black I mean, you somehow uh, reduce the variance, typically, mm -hmm. always rather. This is a fixed point. Here yeah. You, here you have a fixed recursion. Yeah, yeah. Here it's a yeah. So it's uh, but same spirit. I mean, just, uh, you write some linear equation for the quantity you want to solve using one-step analysis. So typically, all these equations involve some one conditional ex expectation somewhere. So the right-hand side will involve a conditional average over either the previous iterate or the next time slot. Okay, and uh, you s write a stochastic approximation version by. Uh, just writing the next guess as 1 minus a n times the previous guess plus a n times whatever correct uh, this uh, right hand side, except that you remove the conditional average and plug in an actual sample. And because of averaging properties of stochastic approximation, the limiting differential equation will be actually of the form x dot equal to fx, where the fx equal to 0 is the what you are looking for, the solution of fx equal to 0. And this is a sort of uh, universal theme for most uh, reinforcement learning algorithms in dynamic programming. Okay. There are other applications, but just for approximate dynamic programming, all those alg all the algorithms tend to have this form. Sometimes you change the dynamic programming equation to make it uh, stochastic approximation friendly. For example, in Q learning, the average is inside a minimum. So instead of the value, you look at what's called the Q value, where the dynamic programming equation pulls the average outside of the minimum. For these, for, for, for these limits that beats the the Monte Carlo, the, the ordinary Monte Carlo bound, and the ordinary Monte Carlo mm -hmm. bound here is going to have an exponentially large variance mm -hmm. because you have a product of n kernels, right? Yeah. So the question is whether you beat that somehow by. I'm not sure if uh, there's any. Seems theoretical analysis, but I think it should be possible. But uh, one, one has, for this kind of algorithms, one has the sort of finite time estimates in the sense that uh, sample complexity kind of bounds are available. But I have not compared them with what one would have for Monte Carlo. So using concentration inequalities, one can show that uh, sort of a certain number of samples will be with high probability within a small ball around the limit. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this uh, another tweak which actually I and my colleagues had used in a different context. So uh, that also we tried here, which is adaptive importance sampling. Here you also change the importance sampling measure. So that's given by this P tilde normalized, and P tilde is defined here, so I'll motivate this in the next slide. So it's, this is your current guess, you sort of multiply your P by this, and uh, take maximum of this and some small number eta. So this actually, uh, eta is, see, because of this eta, I think one, one has to make sure that it's a probability, which is why this normalization, and that has been plugged in there to make sure that there's no division by, very small numbers or zero anywhere. It's a technical tweak. 
Okay, and uh, the reason uh, that particular choice is, was given is that one can sort of argue that this particular thing will be the zero variance measure for him. So the way one chooses important sampling measure is, so you are trying to, uh, suppose you are trying to estimate probability of some rare event, then the ideal measure with which you would sample is the conditional probability given that event. I mean, if you have seen any rare, rare event simulation, this is the sort of, this is the way you start. But that conditional probability is defined in terms of the quantity you are trying to estimate, okay, namely the rare event probability. So you cannot use that measure. So what one typically does is try to come up with a good approximation for that. So the, the here uh, in adaptive importance sampling, one does that recursively because anyway you are estimating it. So at time n you have some estimate, you use that as though it were the correct thing. So this would be the perfect thing one thing to use. Uh, uh, is actually if you write down the equation, things will nicely cancel out and uh, you will immediately get what you want. But this is what you are trying to estimate, so you can't use this. So what I have done is to replace that by the current estimate. Okay, so this is again the kind of standard methodology in the adaptive importance sampling. And as I said, the eta is there just to avoid uh, uh, numerical problems. Okay, now smoothing becomes a little problematic. So here the idea is that I want to estimate uh, f of xn given observations up to some capital N, which is after N. So you are looking at something in the past. So you again, you can write uh, this and uh, you, you will see that it corresponds to nu n of small, nu s, so small n f v hat n. v hat n was the, basically the sum of products. So that was nu sub n, uh, okay. that was the quantity which I, had, I was computing with the terminal value one. Okay. So now you need to plug in this as well. So one can write an appropriate algorithm with the, so this will go from small n, uh, sorry, one uh, zero to small n and at small n I plug in this. So you have to compute this separately and plug it in here and now this is okay if you want to find uh, the conditional expectation at uh, fxn at one fixed n, but suppose you want, uh, okay, look, sorry, something more here, it's essentially the same thing for the normalization factor. So only difference is that I have one here. It's probably an error here as well. No, it's okay. Okay, so anyway, so this convergence can be argued as before. So if it's n equal to zero, means you are trying to estimate the initial condition. The problem arises if you have, the, this is the kind of thing you would have in control problems, sum of some running cost. You, you have to do that for each m. And uh, that becomes uh, not really hard because n may not be small. The capital N may not be small. So one possibility, which again, and depending on the problem, it may or may not help, is to treat this uh, cumulative sum of uh, running cost as an additional state variable and uh, take a, okay, but then again, depending on the problem, this can become unmanageable. Okay, continuous state observation, of course, is basically I'm assuming that there's some nice, uh, everything is mutually absolutely continuous, there are nice densities, then instead of the ratios, you plug in the corresponding radon nicotine derivative of the uh, those kernels. Yeah, that's it. And uh, if it was not a compact state space, one would have to, I mean, some of the, because I was in a finite state space, uh, things were easy, I mean, all this results I claimed didn't, uh, don't need much uh, technical hard work to prove, but in general you would need uh, some stability conditions and movement conditions, etc. to make sure that the proofs go through. Okay, now this is something we have to deal with that the quantities uh, which you are calculating, they become very small, very fast because you are multiplying with a sub-stochastic matrix at all, all times. And, but we are interested in the ratios. So what we did was to every now and then just uh, when it dropped below a certain level, just rescale it. Okay, that doesn't uh, make any difference. 
This is one of the tweaks for computational reasons. Another thing which we have not pursued, but uh, that's a promising direction. Incidentally, uh, this is something we are still working on, so this is not kind of final finished product in some sense, and we are doing more work on this. And one of the ideas is to, at, at least for the continuous state space problems, it will be interesting to import from the reinforcement learning literature the standard approximation architecture, like linear function approximation and so on, that, uh, to bring down the computation. So uh, it would be worthwhile trying those out here. Okay, we have a kind of toy example here, such a simple queuing system, where we sort of cap the uh, uh, sort of queue length at 100. So this is a departure process, IID departure process, IID arrival. Sorry, yeah. Uh, the arrival process is IID. The departure process, uh, the rate is the Markov chain. So this is the, in fact, the unobserved component. So I'm a, uh, we are, it's like a machine repair problem. So there are some two possible rates, A, a and B. And um, this rate uh, is a Markov chain which um, sort of flips between work, uh, two states, which you can think of it as a machine working or faulty. These are some specific values we took. So mu n is the hidden, mu n is x. Yeah, mu n is the, yeah. No, uh, x will be mu n comma x n. And then you have to q n, sorry. Yeah. Mu n comma q n will be the full state. And you're observing just one component of it. Sure. So, yeah. so mu n is, yeah, so you're observing q. You're observing q. So y n in the earlier notation, y n corresponds to q n and x n corresponds to q n comma mu n. But then, Filter is a, I mean, it's a two, a two by two matrix recursion. Yeah. Why yeah. would you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I said that is a toy problem. But I just want to, what we want to demonstrate is that the variance reduction uh, is uh, observed okay. by simulation. That's all. Okay. So these are the assorted parameters which we chose, and yeah, as I said, X n corresponds to this. Uh, rate which is flipping between high and low and uh, the q length and y n is the q length which you observe and the transition probability is that this this uh, uh, Kronecker delta arises because you are actually observing one component of the state and this you can just uh, write down by inspection the transition probabilities and correspondingly the non filter and the algorithm becomes this Okay, there's nothing new here. I'm just translating what I had earlier for this specific example. And similarly for adaptive importance sampling. Okay, so let me, I have the figures later, but I'll just summarize the conclusions. What we found is that, uh, so the naive importance sampling is just using fixed Q. So that leads to lower fluctuations than uh, MCMC if, for, uh, as we increase then. I mean, if, if N was not, not large, say 20, 30, et cetera, the gain was not much. So if uh, the advantage, if any, will be only for large problems. So for n equal to 100, for example, uh, you see that uh, you get a lower variance by using the important sampling and rather the reinforcement learning based scheme. Adaptive important uh, sampling always did better. But of course, there's a trade-off. It's a more complicated scheme, more computation. And uh, so one thing I forgot to mention here is that uh, one thing which we found uh, for see adaptive import assembly, if you start adaptation right in the beginning, uh, it's kind of uh, some numerical issues. What we do is just uh, run naive import assembling for a certain length and then switch to adaptive. That works better. Now, naive import assembling doesn't require I mean, the uh, same amount of simulation as MCMC, but uh, the uh, higher per iterate con computation because you are calculating some more computation involved. Adaptive, however, increases both because uh, the two, uh, these two quantities you cannot, uh, uh, you need actually, if you look at the algorithm, you need different samples. It's not the same sample, you can recycle for both. So it, uh, twice as many simulations. So in the show that uh, I mean, there's no, no one scheme which is uniformly superior to the other, but there are regimes where you see advantages of any of them. Okay, so you can see that this was small. This uh, there's a gain, and you can see that lower variance. But of course, the variance was not high anyway. Huh? 
this one with uh, without important sample this naive important sampling and um, the uh, just mcmc just taking the uh, what i call it mcmc you would call it mcmc as you pointed out just the law of large numbers yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah so the with uh, important sampling you get lower variance so it starts becoming getting better and better with uh, if you increase then so larger problems you see the significant gain and this is adaptive adaptive does much better of course this is where the adaptive kept in as i said we don't start adaptive right in the beginning because initially it's uh, totally off if you started right in the beginning but just run naive for a while and then start switch to adaptive and it, it does much better of course the computations are much a lot more as well what are the numbers on the axis so it's 10 to the 6 iterations yeah and what is the decibels? What, what, what is the scale? I can't no, this is, is a... Zero? What, what, what is that? No, it's the same, should be same as here. <coughs> minus three and minus one. Now that's quite expensive for such a simple problem, right? Yeah, I mean, see, we are not... Uh, I'm working with an undergraduate, we are not optimized this or anything. It's just, uh, just to kind of... Uh, proof of concept kind of simulations. But your buffer size is 100, right? Hmm? Your buffer size is 100, how are you starting your Yeah. You're starting at empty and you're only taking 100 steps, so you can't fill. The buffer you're observing, so this doesn't enter the complexity problem at all. Yeah, it's just the No, so, uh, yeah, buffer size is 100. It's without the conditional distribution, so you know, it's, it's, it's completely relevant for okay. the, it should not make any difference for the computation okay. complexity either. Because you see a fixed path of the two, and that's just a two-state number of changes. Yeah, so this is the, the number of samples of the capital M that, uh, so you run this uh, pass again and again. Oh, I see, yeah, of course, because uh, it's actually for 10 to the 6 steps or something. Yeah. I see, okay. And similarly, for 200, you get, uh, in fact, the uh, naive kind of averaging did pretty badly here. Okay, some future directions which were, oops. So one thing we want to try is the EM algorithm in this framework. So this, instead of uh, this pure estimate here, there's some unknown parameter which you try to estimate. Then as I already mentioned, uh, hope, uh, try to see if uh, incorporation of function approximation, like linear function approximation, etc., can help. And uh, finally, this was the sort of long-term motive to, to so, reinforcement learning for partially observed Markov decision process is kind of a gray area. And uh, at least if you consider parameterized control policies, perhaps one can use this kind of approach to get somewhere. So it might be through. Yeah, I'm through. <laughs> <laughs> Got a dynamic programming, you know, uh, formulation for like this. I mean, you. This, I mean, I, I, you, I mean, you've mentioned function approximation. Mm -hmm. I mean, either, either it's true or it's not. So I mean, the problem is it's time varying. You've got VM, and you don't want a, a, a function approximation for v, each VM. But uh, do you have any hope of somehow changing the problem so you can you can you can get all the new bases? I, I, mean, I can't see how to do it yet. I, I, I want to see it. The, the time varying nature is what scares me. Yeah. No, so yeah, so we're looking at uh, the sort of value function clone has two arguments: the state and the current. So v of i comma n. Yeah, the n scares me. Yeah, so you'll have to yeah, you, uh, factor that into the. Is there any hope of uh, dealing with that? Is it so? No, so you'll have to take a function. Uh, the function approximation will also have to involve functions which yeah. depend on n. Then you'll have. Yeah, the number of parameters will, will, will grow with capital M. So yeah, that's, that's true. What, yeah, that no, but there are, uh, I know that there's uh, some uh, some work in finance community which does look at the sort of fin finite horizon problem in, uh, with reinforcement learning. So I have to check exactly how they manage.